Welcome on inside yet another edition of the Business of Social podcast powered by STN Digital. I'm your host, David Brickley. Each and every show, we talk to the experts to get their advice on the ever-changing digital social marketing landscape. This show is a little bit different. It's been a while since we've done a mini show or a mini pod here, Will. So uh, we like to talk in Slack a lot about what we see out there in the stratosphere. And uh, you and I had a few few main topics, a few major topics the last couple of weeks. So no day better than the present. Um, I'll throw it to you, Will. What do we what do we got here on the agenda today? Yeah, three, uh, three things, I think, as we kind of start to wrap up the year in the pod and um, we're not as, I don't want to say as busy, but the schedule, the stars align for a mini pod today. Uh, so three main topics, the first one being the most prominent, in my opinion, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp are currently down. <laughs> <laughs> so as we record this October 4th, uh, no big deal. I think uh, Facebook is worth about a trillion dollars. That puppy was down all day. As we record this, I think it just came back up, actually. All of our clients asking us what the deal is. Uh, do you have any inside information? Like, hey, we're following the Twitter threads and the Reddit threads just like you all are. But I heard Zuckerberg lost $7 billion in net worth today. And one, um, if you look at 2020, Facebook brought in about $86 billion in, in net revenue, uh, not net, but in overall revenue. Uh, so that equates to about $235 million a day, Will. So, Will, I know you've had maybe some tough days here and there, maybe an off day here at STN. I don't think you've had a day quite like the Facebook engineer team here on Monday, October 4th. Yeah, a little bit of perspective, no matter how, <laughs> if you're having a tough day at work. It's probably not as bad as having uh, literally nothing to use and not being able to do your job. Well, whatsoever. what's interesting, too, is I don't know if I've seen a platform go down this long. I've seen Facebook, Twitter, even Google, Gmail, to a certain extent, go out for an hour, hour and a half. I mean, this thing was down for, I mean, almost the entire day. I mean, I would say if I had to guess six hours, six plus hours, maybe even more, but they literally had to go. I, I heard reports that they had to go to their California servers and manual restart. This is what you tell your mom and your grandma when they're saying uh, their iPhone's not working correctly. Me and Will are saying, hey, have you tried restarting? But that's pretty crazy how <laughs> it got all the way. to HDMI 1 to HDMI yeah, 2. It's exactly. take a couple seconds. But it's pretty crazy how it got to that point where they couldn't just do – I heard people couldn't get in the building like their entire infrastructure was complete. Their their emails didn't work. I was going to say, I'm assuming most of their communication is based on the software that they use internally. Now, so. what's so interesting about these different platforms? They should play or not, they should play nicer together, in my opinion. But you know, Facebook's like Twitter is the is the competitor, so they don't really communicate with their staff or probably promote that. But how do you communicate with your staff when your email's down? You can't get in the building. I mean, hopefully they had a nice Slack room there to get the get the memo out. Yeah, you got to have Slack or uh, Teams or whatever, and you better hope you have everybody's phone number saved because, yeah, that's, that stuff goes out the window pretty quick. So uh, there was a guy named Doug Midori. He is the director of internet analysis at a network monitoring firm. He said, quote, I don't know if I've seen an outage like this before from a major internet firm ever. Like, this is like historic in nature. And this is all after that 60 Minutes piece came out. Um, you know, recently actually with the entire Facebook whistleblower claimed the company is aware of how the platforms are being used for evil and hate and violence and doesn't necessarily want to crush Facebook, but wants to take steps to help them get to a better place. So I saw some stuff on Twitter too, that that was kind of all intertwined and someone hacked them. And I guess all that stuff is going to come out maybe by the time everybody hears this podcast, but overall a very interesting day over at Facebook Inc. And you don't really know who to blame. I mean, we've heard Facebook is gone for good. It's never coming back. Yeah. You know, it's temporary. It already is back. Um, it's just some type of problem with the, the you know, the network highway is what they're calling it on mm -hmm. Twitter. It, it could be one of a million things. Nobody really knows. But uh, I tweeted this right when this happened, and I mean it. Today was a brilliant day to start a TikTok uh, yeah. platform or to start a TikTok brand if you haven't done that already. Uh, it's all about diversification, right? So not only if you're all in on Facebook, Instagram, you know, you just lost a whole day and maybe a day doesn't hurt you as much, but imagine the person that was doing a 24 hour sale for their e-course and that was trying to pay rent th today, or imagine the person that was trying to grow followers for a certain metric for a new brand that was turned off. Right. So although this stuff is rare, I think it reintroduces and redefines the importance of diversifying your brand, not only across Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, et cetera, but also do you own your, your consumer or does Facebook own it, right? Do you have emails? Can you send uh, email newsletters out or are you relying purely on these platforms to communicate with your consumer that is really the, 
I don't know, the lifeblood of your company of actually creating cash and paying bills and things like that. So if anything, hopefully people listening to this show will understand that this can happen. What if it was down for two days, a week? I mean, things could potentially happen. Um, and it's nice to be able to say, you know what? I have a great following on Twitter. I'm going to go all in on Twitter today if you're a major brand. Yeah, I was going to ask you as a uh, someone I would consider an expert in the in the social media space. Oh, thanks, Will. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. um, let's just say hi- hypothetically, yeah. the, these do never come back. Facebook mm-hmm. and Instagram cease to exist. I wonder how the landscape of, obviously, I think TikTok and Twitter would go way up. But what does that look like if you are a brand or a person or an influencer or an athlete? Well, in a world where they both just ceased to exist and they had to start from scratch and every brand lost their followers and lost everything. I mean, I don't think that's possible because obviously you can back up on servers. I mean, literally every second, but I'm sure Facebook at least every 24 hours has a carbon copy of not only their entire blueprint of what they do and everybody's profile, but I'm sure that's spread out across the globe. So if they, you know, if California servers ever got nuked or something like that, they can still, you know, go to Sweden and, and, and populate it. So I think there's so many duplicates that would never happen. But hypothetically, uh, if that did happen, I mean, you, you have to start thinking about small businesses. And I mean, you're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars of people not only communicating with their consumer, but actually the Facebook marketplace and Facebook advertisements. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people lost a lot of money today. That's the thing. I, I know friends that make millions of dollars a day sometimes on Facebook through just Facebook ads and, you know, checking out, you know, Amazon type, you know, checkouts, things like that, where they're directing people to a checkout page through shopping, um, Shopify, et cetera. So a lot of businesses, even though we're talking hypothetically, what if it went away forever? A lot of businesses lost money today just with it being down for a majority of the day. And I think, I mean, a lot of stuff that we work on too is like, people don't realize it's very calendared out. Like, you know what you're going to be doing on December 1st already a lot of the times, or at least for a certain portion of your business. So to have all of that kind of get messed up and having to push back by a couple of days, or if you have an X amount of budget for your October 4th paid yes. media post. Imagine, imagine just... this happened on Black Friday. Oh, God. I mean, think about it for a second. Yeah. If this happens on Black Friday, even just eight hours being down, I mean, you're talking about, I would I don't even know what the numbers are, billions and billions and billions of dollars in lost revenue because, I mean, if you're smart, you're using the Facebook and Instagram apparatus for all of your paid media, for pushing people to your store, uh, sales, clearances, e-courses, e-learning, all that stuff is powered by that. Because honestly, if I am the expert, Will, um, Twitter and and even Google to a certain extent does not provide the ROI that Facebook and Instagram still do. It's a very, very mature platform in terms of reaching your core consumer. So yeah, at least it wasn't Black Friday. We can say that. Glass half full. <laughs> yeah, that would be or, or Cyber Monday, but yeah, that would uh, that's a great point. I did buy uh, shares of Facebook during this whole meltdown because it was down five percent. I think uh, on the day the stock went down seventeen dollars. Uh, on the month, it's down like forty after all this like whistleblower stuff. But I'm still I'm still trading high in Facebook. I think the the people freak out in days like this, but overall, uh, still all in. As long as it doesn't get deleted permanently, I think you're you're okay there. Yep. Um, anything else in this? Or you want to go let's to go, let's keep two? on rolling. Okay. Second thing, uh, on a much lighter note, um, the ESPN Monday Night Football Manning Cast broadcast, I think, has been very well received and overall a huge success. And I know we both were were talking about it and wanted to kind of touch base on. Yeah, it. you know, it's funny. On week one, I saw it as the first on my YouTube TV. It was the first block over the actual mainstream, so oh, I clicked into it. And I, don't, and I don't know if YouTube TV or ESPN made it that way, or maybe it was just my preferences or what, but it was weird that ESPN2 was the the block that they were promoting over ESPN when you look at it from left to right. Anyways, so I started watching it, and then, Will, I found myself just watching it for the rest of the game. I thought it was really entertaining. I think they had some audio issues. Um, I don't know if Russell Wilson was week one, but I think Russ called in. Yeah, he was. And he had some audio issues. Um, but overall, like I just think it's a... <sighs> It's a better product. You know, was, there was a tweet that came across my timeline that I thought was super funny, but it said, quote, it doesn't seem very smart of ESPN to put Peyton and Eli on ESPN2, not because it's not a great idea, but because surely nobody's watching the main broadcast. <laughs> and I feel like a lot of people on Twitter, this stuff was kind of going viral. You know, on week three, Eli Manning's, you know, flipping the bird and that's getting screenshotted. And it was really interesting because I like the organic nature of it where these guys are just on the couch like you and I would be. Right. I remember week one, 
Eli's like, oh, this is great. Why don't you ice in your own kicker? That's a good move. And just the way he was talking like that as if it was you and I was very um, – very cool to see because obviously the guys that are buttoned up in the broadcast booth can't can't talk like that. It's very genuine, and I yep. I know ESPN has tried stuff like this before, like the college football playoff. They'll have like the coaches table, and it's just never really like had staying power. But for so they put a lot of time and effort into this. I mean, they had big time guests all three weeks, and it just it works. Like it's just too but smart. I would guys love that- for you, Will, to pull up that clip that you and I talked about uh, during right when COVID was happening during quarantine. But I said specifically, this is a mass education at scale across the whole nation, across the whole globe of people entering into a Zoom. I guarantee you in 2019, if you asked LeBron to join the Manning cast, he would have to have handlers. He'd have to set up. He had to go to maybe even a satellite booth, probably. Yeah, exactly. And the fact that Russell Wilson, LeBron James, Gronk, you could say, can you join a Zoom tomorrow, a, a Monday for like a quick 15 minutes? I sure. And everybody knows, every celebrity, every athlete has been asked at home to have a laptop set up, maybe with decent lighting. They've already figured out what their best background looks like. They found a quiet room where their kids can't bug them. That is, that's huge. And and we talked about it earlier, and it's so cool seeing it come to fruition. This show doesn't exist pre-COVID, in my opinion, because sure, it would be fun to watch uh, Peyton and Eli on the couch talk about football, but the fact that they could bring in stars like LeBron and bring stars like Ru- Russell Wilson, I mean, those are huge names that only help when it comes to getting the rating and, and help to get the dialogue on Twitter going. Yeah, my uh, my first thought in producer brain is like, I wonder if they, ESPN does have a team that goes out to LeBron and is like, no. it, it can't just be a regular Zoom, can it? It is. Is it that easy? It's exactly what it is. I mean, that's just that makes everything so much easier. But they and really you can tell some of that time the audio is kind of bad. You see it choppy sometimes. The it but gets for the blurry. Most part, it's been pretty solid for a you yeah. know, for millions of people watching a uh, nationally televised. But you're broadcast. also talking about 18 months for LeBron James. He's probably joining like 27 different Zoom calls. Not only for broadcasts like that, but when he's talking to Maverick Carter about a business deal, when he's talking to his right. assistant, these guys have used it just like you and I've used it. So now it's so much easier where you don't have to ask the social media manager or the handler or the agent to be involved. You don't have to, you know, send a car to send them to a satellite studio, which used to be the case. But LeBron, he wants to just chill with his family at his house. He doesn't want to go get a limo, go to a studio, you know, get a green screen behind him, like be mic'd up and all that stuff. He doesn't want to deal with it. So no, he's not going to do it. It's 20 minutes with the Mannings. You open it, your computer, talk football, close it, and you're on a But the, the, the accessibility – to yeah. celebrities and athletes, and also the easiness, if that's a word, for these guys and gals to be able to join a Zoom and be on broadcast television with someone that he admires like Peyton Manning. I mean, that just changed the game. And I think the reason I bring this up is, as all of you are listening about ideas and content opportunities, this has just unlocked an entire new ability for all of us, knowing that a LeBron James, a Denzel Washington, an Ariana Grande is literally – a phone call away and they can manage everything themselves from a production standpoint. And that technology is only going to get better as we move forward. So even if they have to use their cell phone, it's still potential 4k footage uh, when you're talking about it. So this is incredible. And this, again, this is something that you wonder COVID happens. What's this going to be silver lining? What's going to birth out of the COVID environment? You're watching it right now at the Madden cast. I'm, we've come a long way from, I'm sure you remember like back in the day at Lakers games, they would have to go like courtside with a mic to whatever celebrity was sitting there yep. and have them like talk real time into yep. the game. So some quick numbers here. Uh, the broadcast rose recently 132% week over week. The ratings overall, so week one only had 800,000 views, but then a lot of people found out about it, I think, because of Twitter and their friends. And I mean, we talked about around the water cooler all day Tuesday here at the office. Uh, week two, 1.8 million. So they grew a million followers or a million viewers. Week three, 1.89 as well. So the first week, they were 5% of the total Monday Night Football audience. Week two, they were 13.5% of the total Monday Night Football audience, and then about 13% the week after. So that's really, really interesting. People are really angry that they took what? I think they're taking week four, five, and six off. I think they had three weeks guaranteed, and then they come back in week seven. Uh, right. And people don't like that, but they are returning for seven more games on ESPN this season. So and I'm sure ESPN, top brass, social people are all you know scrambling for what can we do now? What guests can we get? Because they came out of the gates strong, and I think they've done a great job. Uh, but 
said the joke earlier that I saw on Twitter, like it's a great idea, but surely nobody's going to watch the main broadcast yet. I actually saw this quote from Freddie Rowland. He's the ESPN vice president of programming and acquisitions. I'm excited to talk to Matt Kinney, who's coming up on the show yeah. too. He is, a, um, I think, a VP as well of programming and acquisitions, more on the boxing and UFC side. But Freddie Rowland is more on the uh, NFL side. And he said, at the end of the day, we're not competing against ourselves. We win no matter which one they tune into. Uh, their goal overall is to increase. So they feel like they've increased their audience by 3 to 5%. Mm. People that would have never watched Monday Night Football are now watching because of the Manning cast. So they've actually increased their audience rather than simply pulling audience away from the main broadcast and watching the Manning cast. So um, they did it with an expectation to lift that audience. And so far, so good. I mean, to pull a 1.8, almost a 2 rating on ESPN2 directly against the main broadcast is amazing. And and no offense to Steve Levy and Lewis Riddick, Brian Greasy, professionals, really good at what they do, but just don't really pull you in uh, like, like an Eli and a Peyton can. I mean, I think this is definitely the kind of tip of the iceberg for stuff like this, whether it's sports or entertainment or whatever, but getting two or three experts that's kind of a more casual conversation and not so rigid well, um, and having guests. And I'll I, give our boy uh, Dave Feldman, who is, I think, the creator of this over at NFL, but they had the Zoom cast during the draft. Kevin Hart, Michael Strahan, Deion Sanders, Rich Eisen, Tom Brady, Travis Kelsey, DJ Khaled. Again, there's no way in hell you're getting all those people in a broadcast right. studio in Los Angeles. The flights, the hotels alone from a production standpoint and from a cost standpoint is so tough. But hey, Kevin, can we pay you a, a good chunk of change to just log into a Zoom for an hour and then you can go play with your kids literally minutes after? It's it's really, I think, an opportunity that not enough of us content creators are thinking about. And if you're working for a brand right now, um, start thinking about how to utilize this asset. Because again, the access to talent has always been such an issue for all of us content creators, and now it's easier than ever. Yeah, I, uh, I, I just, I'm excited to see where they go with this, and I, like, my mind was spinning for any type of future events, like the Grammys. Imagine having three musicians up there, be like, "Oh, the first time I went on stage, this happened." Blah blah blah. Yeah, I just think the sky's the limit for this kind of broadcast. Yeah. and they, they've had mega casts. I know for like the college football playoff. Yeah. They've had it for Super Bowls in but the past. But it was always everyone in the same room, too. Yeah, they're all in the same room. And and I just love the element of let's bring on LeBron for a quarter. Let's bring on Gronkowski for a quarter. Especially active players that just don't play Monday night. They, they yeah, played they on played, Sunday. Yeah. I mean, they had Travis Kelsey on. He didn't know who they were playing the next. He's like, oh, I don't know who we got next week. Exactly. We'll but be ready for It's so cool. These guys are fresh off a of victory or fresh off a of big Sunday performance. And you're getting an exclusive with them. And LeBron's talking about how Pete Carroll and the Cowboys sent him a contract during... Yeah, uh, yeah. During the NBA lockout back in 08, I think. But uh, it's just hilarious. It's just like you're getting exclusive stuff that's going to take off on Twitter, go viral. And with all due respect to the major broadcast, they're just calling the game. The one piece of feedback I have for the ESPN producers, I might uh, send my information here into the great uh, Freddie Rowland here. No, um, but I do think, you know, it would be nice. At, let's say we're talking right now as something that happens, Will, and we're, we're in mid conversation. Just being able to pause, like, oh, and there's a, yep, there's a touchdown mm -hmm. by Dak to, is that Amari Cooper? So now the Cow Cowboys are up by seven now. And then get back into it. But I think Eli and Peyton aren't trained enough to do that. So they're talking over major moments, major hits, yeah. Yeah. major touchdowns. And they have the broadcast, you know, sound down so low, which makes sense. But it'd be cool to kind of be able to, I don't know if you get a third person in there that can just be that, like, Joy Taylor you know, skipping, skipping Shannon, kind right. of that, that mid person. Uh, but I think if Peyton and Eli could be trained a little bit to pause the conversation, talk about a huge event and then gear it back, that would make for a better, a better program. I, I agree with you. I do think the volume needs to go up a little bit on the game itself. And just, I think they're also just used to talking to each other and they're just like shooting the shit and they don't realize that there's a touchdown. So yeah, some kind of a little bit of coaching of like, Pause, let the play develop, and then go back to your yeah. whatever your story is. But they've man, they've had some great stories and the ESPN Rolodex from McAfee to LeBron to Yes, McAfee Nick was Saban, great too. I mean, they have had heavy hitters. But I mean, I'm weeks. somewhat broadcast trained, but they teach color commentators if you're talking about like an X's and O's and someone makes a big play to reference it. Mark Jackson does a great job of this on the NBA on ABC broadcast. They'll say, Oh, just a great fundamental move there by Coy Bryant as Steve Nash hits that three. But Kobe does such a great job. You know, he kind of like tells you yeah. what happens in real time. And I think if they could add that to the repertoire, it'd be really interesting uh, because I think that's the one thing missing from 
for the Manning cast, but I'm sold. I'm watching it every Monday when uh, Omaha Productions decides to fire up the <laughs> fire up the studio. I Omaha Productions too. I've seen them doing a little bit on Twitter there. Whoever's running that account. Well, then they, they got some stuff with ESPN Plus as well. I mean, at first, yeah. what was the Manning show? Peyton's, Peyton's places. Peyton's places. Then is it Eli's places now too? But yeah, <laughs> Eli I has something know too. Peyton's places. Uh, so they've. They probably signed the multi-year deal with, with yeah. The well, it was a uh, it was a good good, a good move for ESPN. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, third and final topic. One last thing I'll say on that. Yeah, yeah. Monday Night Football has kind of been the laughing stock of broadcasts uh, as as far as football goes. I think Fox, CBS, there hasn't been up, but there's been a lot of chatter about that broadcast booth. A lot of changes, the Booker Mobile, all that stuff. Remember a couple of years ago they had like the yellow. Um, like anytime something happened, they yeah, made the screen yeah, yellow yeah. and it was like the same color as a flag. So they've tried a lot of stuff to make news and make headlines. And I think they've been not laughed at, but I mean, there just hasn't been a lot of positive PR. This is brilliant. Good for ESPN because yeah. I know they have the target on their back. They're the, the worldwide leader. They're Disney. But they have had a lot to um, applaud for, for the last few years. It's been kind of bland in a way. And I just like kudos to ESPN because they tried something new. It could have been laughed at, but I mean, when you get star power like Manning, you probably can't. But I love the addition of bringing on big stars because if it was just Eli and Peyton up there, it probably wouldn't have been well received. But the the pure marketing genius of did you hear what LeBron said last night? Monday Night Football. Yeah, that is brilliant. So and credit to, to ESPN for actually letting them do that because if you just put Eli or Peyton in a booth with two other like pros like a Joe, it'd be Buck, stiff. Yeah, stiff. Exactly. I and think. I and I thought Eli throughout his career was pretty stiff in interviews and kind of a dork. Yeah, he's got a great personality. But I love his personality. I love how genuine he is. Again, like the friend on the couch, and they teach you a lot of stuff too. I, here's one thing I learned: is you never want to um, like. Why am I missing the the term here? A fake hike. What is it? A hard count. You never want to do a hard count inside the 10-yard line because if you're at the 5-yard line, you do a hard count and your guy jumps, you're going back 5 yards. If they jump, you only go up 2 and a half. Right. So it's never it's never worth the risk and reward. And they said that. I'm like, wow, I learned something new today. That's yeah, actually you, really you, important. That, you really do learn something every time. It's pretty and cool. I, I will say for Eli, he's he's not scared to kind of challenge Peyton because it's his brother. Yes. They're similar career-wise. It's not like... Peyton and just some guys like, oh, you're absolutely right, Mr. Manning. So, uh, so yeah, again, it, it just works all the way through. All right. And finally, the last topic is we wanted to talk about just really how the social media industry has changed. And again, going back to this, this heightened access to talent because that we've all been educated at scale, you know, we've also noticed and will, you know, all your colleagues can appreciate this, but <laughs> STN being a social first agency, I mean, we're so busy. Yeah. We have so much demand that we can barely keep up that we've actually turned away a lot of business because we're like, hey, we can't guarantee you quality. We have our active clients that we have to make sure that we take care of first and foremost. But we can start you in 2022. We can onboard, onboard you in February, which is a blessing. And we're so thankful for that. And people obviously, you know, coming to us for their server or for services. But it's been really insane. I mean, here at STM, but across the board, there was a survey that came out that social media spending increased from 13.3% of marketing budgets in February of 2020 to 23.2% just six months later. So a 74% lift, a lot of that had to do with like, let's take our money from billboards and print, let's put it all on the digital. That's really important. But CMO is now anticipating, Will, that you know these investments will remain high and that the online customer experience, 60.8% of CMOs indicated they have shifted resources to building customer-facing digital interfaces, and 56% plan to transform their go-to-market business models to focus on digital opportunities. That's why we're busy. But I wanted to say to the listeners out there, a lot of you work, I mean, almost all of you work in marketing, social media, social media managers, you are in the right industry. Jobs are coming, higher paid jobs are coming, more senior roles are coming. All these things are so important because what used to be the ugly step salad at the in the in the boardroom is now becoming the focus. And we even talked about it at nauseum, Will. First of all, we've screamed. I, I wanted to jump in and say, yeah. you know, I, I do want to give you uh some credit. I, I think we have proof of you saying this for at least oh what three years now. So you're saying I'm some type of expert that you think I am. I've, okay. I've, I would yeah. I would feel comfortable saying that. Well, I mean and man, even going back to when we first started the company back in 2013, we were putting together monetization decks. Like, hey, you should be monetizing your platforms right. here. That still is not being done at scale. But you know, this is no news to you and I. We've been screaming from the rooftops for 10 plus years. I've been saying it on the podcast. But now Fortune 500 starting to get it. That's where a lot of the money is, obviously. And now the C-suite starting to get it. 
the CEOs, the CMOs, maybe people that were a little, you know, a little older, they didn't really grow up in the social age. They got woke up by COVID, like we've talked about with a lot of panelists, with a lot of brands. And here's the deal. Consumer spending's on the rise. It's up $3.2 billion in the first half of 2021. That's up 50% year over year. So, you know, we've made this joke that you give any social media platform long enough, it turns into a mall. You know, Facebook Marketplace, Instagram Shopping, now TikTok is coming out with that. Because once you can reach a consumer and you can monetize your consumer, you're going to find a way to take them offline and go to your store type thing. But just be ready for this. The budgets are coming. We've already seen that happen. It's come to fruition. This this uh, this snowball is not going to stop. And if you're that social media manager working your ass off at that NBA or NFL team and you feel overworked, stay, stay in there, hang in there with me because your resume alone is going to be so sought after by every major brand across the nation, across the globe, because this is the number one thing everybody wants to get better at, everybody's investing more money at, and more importantly, the really huge Fortune 500 companies are finally waking up here. So um, just wanted to shout everybody out that's been working in this industry and been saying this stuff for years now that uh, the time's now, you know, for even for STM, we're an eight-year overnight uh, record here um, or overnight success after eight years in the business. But you know, we've just never seen demand like this in our history. You know, in this digital mall that you've just created, I was just thinking like, if you were walking through the mall, like, boy, I could really use a pair of shoes and up pops a shoe store, you know, two feet down. It's like, not only are they getting money for advertisements, yeah. but they can also cater to what you are looking for and put it literally right in front of your face. Yep. So I think a lot of brands felt vulnerable. They were asked by their CEO and their bosses, "What the? what's our digital plan? Oh, we have like this agency that like retweets stuff. Like, what? No, we need like an actual strategy. We need day-to-day -day management. We need to launch a TikTok. We need to be on Twitter spaces. You know, what's going on with Clubhouse? These questions are now being asked by investors, by C-suite, and now everybody's budgets. Again, you can't, even though you know social media is important, if your boss is not allowing budget or allocating budget, there's not a lot you can right. do. I was going to say, I think it's, it, it was the opposite of yes. like, I am the director of social. I'm telling you to do X, Y, and Z, all the stuff. And you're like, no, 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 we're just going to continue to do the traditional stuff. And now it's coming from reverse. And we're seeing this across the board with a lot of our partners and colleagues in the space where you know they're hiring um, at a high clip, as are we to catch up with this because you know now so many people are asking for digital exclusive. No, we only want this on social. I mean, even the the, the amount of money, and you, Will, you know this better than anybody, you and I are working on the sales side for, shoot, five years now. The amount of money that brands are now willing to spend on one platform. Yeah. Like we want an agency of record for TikTok and here's our monthly budget. It's jaw dropping compared to what it was just three years ago from what we were seeing because they understand the ROI on that. Um, so it's just, it's just really cool to see I'm pumped. Um, and I do think, you know, it did take kind of like black swan event and it's, it's so unfortunate. So many things that happened, but again, if you want to talk about the small, small silver linings of this from a digital social side, this is what c came of it is people finally woke up. That's uh, another good point you make. Um, you know, people realize, oh, what's our social strategy? Well, it's almost like what's our TikTok strategy because mm -hmm. that doesn't work for Twitter and which doesn't work for Facebook, which currently doesn't work at all. But the point being is you can't just have a social strategy and it works for everything. You got to be custom. You well, be it, just, it goes back to like, you know, your money too. Like what's your investment strategy? What's your portfolio look like? Well, you know, I have like a savings account. I got a bank account. Like, well, you know, no, like what's actual your like, you know, weekly, monthly, yeah. what's your 401k? What's your IRA? What stocks are you in? Um, and constantly tweaking that with a financial planner. That's the same thing with social. And so many brands before this just had a couple platforms and maybe hired an agency to community manage or whatever, but never truly used the benefits and the power of these platforms. And they're starting to understand it. And it's all working too. I think people are actually yes. seeing results. It's not like we are putting all of our money into social and paid and it just does not work for us. It's like, hey, this is great. Turn that up. It's no longer a nice to have. It's a need to have. And it's no longer like, oh, this potentially could work. No, it, it is working. So yes. let's like throw more money at it. Because again, from a marketer standpoint, we've always said this, but it's so much easier and cheaper to meet your consumer uh, and to reach your consumer on the Facebook and Instagrams of the world. That's why so many people lost money today as Facebook and Instagram went down. But other than your traditional print and your billboards, again, great for a 360 marketing plan. But um, when you're talking about just the pure ROI and the best bang for your buck, 
there's nothing better. So I'm not telling you guys anything you haven't heard or anything you don't know, but I just wanted to kind of round that up because, you know, us as a company, a social first marketing agency, I think everybody's looking for one of those these days. And secondly, um, again, if you're if you're in the industry and you're on the grind and uh, just know that your resume is going to be so sought after for not only this year, but for 10 years to come that you are playing in the right industry. So good for you for knowing damn well what uh, what the right move was so many years ago. Um, that's all I got for you topics wise. All I right. That was the mini pod. That was good. Good. We got to do these more often. So we appreciate you guys. Obviously appreciate producer will for pulling the stories and, uh, coming into the studio here to record the pod. Uh, thank you to Furkers. We always do. Thanks to producer will. We've been, you know, a few, few, uh, staff members rating us five stars on uh, iTunes. What a, <laughs> What amazing colleagues you have there, Will. Uh, just, yeah, you know, the nicest people that work here. Um, all Thanks right. So thank you so much. Uh, this has been another edition of the Business of Social, a mini pod edition of the Business of Social podcast. Uh, it has been powered by SCN Digital. I'm your host, David Brickley. We will see you next time.